All right, the subject we've been looking at for several weeks, I don't know how many weeks, but the emphasis is living Christ. We looked at living Christ for uh, living Christ facing temptations, living Christ facing trials. I think we did another one or so, but tonight we're looking at one that um, I think is needful, and yet it might be obvious, but we'll see. Living Christ for others. And I want to start off with 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 as the first scripture. Um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And here's what we're going to look at. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. So sometimes it's nice to hear messages that encourage you, messages that lift you up. But... Sometimes there has to be one where there's reproof and correction and instruction. And that so happens to be one of those um, tonight. This is a message that God just slipped into my spirit um, about a week and a half ago, a couple weeks ago on, on my deck. I was just sitting there meditating. And, um, and all of a sudden, I get this, this word competition. And I shared a couple weeks ago, that, or a week ago or so, that God had given it to us, or to me, to share to us as a body, and maybe whoever else wants to listen to it. But um, I just want to jump into it because the, the, the stuff that came to me um, is very practical and yet profound at the same time. This is very liberating because um, competition is applauded in America, and it's in the church. And because it's Americanized, it's something that um, we, we teach our kids. We, we, I mean, when you think about competition, you have, you have a winner and you have a what? You have a loser. And so we have to ask the question, how is, is competition part of the kingdom? So I'm just going to give you scriptures. We're going to talk about it let, and let you decide where you land on this as I have. Romans 14, 7. Um, I'm just going to give you these scriptures here. Keep in mind, competition in the back of your mind. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. So Paul's saying here, in Romans 14 is a really good chapter, because it's about preference. It's about, you might want to partake of something that the scriptures are silent on, and somebody else doesn't, and they think it's a sin. And if you go through there, Paul basically is talking about days and meats and stuff like that, that they were contending with. And, he's, and, he, and the bottom line was, if I'm doing something that offends somebody, then I shouldn't do it in front of them because it's going, it's going to offend them. And so you don't want to just let your liberty just be seen by weaker brothers because it could cause them to stumble and fall. And Paul says, we're, we're, we're about... We're about benefiting each other and the gospel going out, and we don't want anything to interfere with the message. And, you know, that's Romans 14, but this is where it comes from. None of us lives to himself. And that is huge because you have to consider everything we do, and, and I'm telling you, it, it's, it, it's not in the church in this generation, at least. And that doesn't mean nobody's living this. I'm saying I'm just making a generalization. But the, it's more... Um, we think that we're in, it's, it's individualized it's about me and what God can do for me and we never think about what, how we live and what we do in view of somebody else now watch what he says here in Corinthians or yeah 1 Corinthians 12 a little lengthy here but watch this for as the body is one it has many members now he's He's looking at the church as a body, like you have a body, and there are many members to your body, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So again, this is not about you by yourself. This is about you with the body, the body of Christ. Now watch, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For in fact, he's, now he's comparing the body of Christ to your physical body. Also is Christ, for in fact the body is not one member but many. If the foot 
should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Next. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one, individually but corporately, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased, and if they were all one members, where would the body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... On these we, be we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have great modesty. But our, pres our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another, and one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. I'll just keep that up. Is it? Is no, go back. Now keep that up there. You see this last part? I've, it's, it, this is a self-explanatory scripture. I'm not going to go in. You, you know. But look at this last part. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer. So do you realize, in the, and, and I'm speaking in the church. We know how the world is, those outside the church. But in the church, when there's competition... We love it when somebody fails because that elevates us if we are in competition. Do you, do you realize that there are people in competition with you and you don't know it? They're watching your every move. They're watching what you wear. They're at, and and if, if, you, if you're in a really big church, they're waiting for you to fall so they can take your place. You know, if you're the head deacon, yeah, I want to be the head deacon. And when somebody suffers, it's like it, now I can capitalize on somebody's misfortune and step in. This is how I have I've seen this. This is predominant. All right. So if somebody is honored, we get jealous. So if somebody suffers, we're glad. So you know that makes me look better. It's a one-upmanship. You sinned, I didn't. I never committed a sin like that. So that elevates me in the in the body. But where is my suffering? with you who's suffering. And then if, if one member's honored, I get jealous, but he told, he told me I'm supposed to rejoice when someone's get, getting honored. So there's, there, there, you can't tell me there's not competition in the church. There's a lot of competition on Facebook and social media. We'll get into that here shortly too. Next one, Ephesians 4.16. Now I'm giving you how the body's supposed to relate to each other. It is So far we don't see we're individuals as an island apart, that we are purposely. I look at this one. From whom the this is Ephesians 4:16. From whom the whole body is jointly fitted together or joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And love is key in, in all of this. So we see that we are a body that's jointly fitted together. So you can see that your, your, your right hand can't be in competition with your left hand, right? Because then you would only be one, you would only use, have one hand, or this one's struggling to lift something, and this one's like, I'm not going over there to help you. You, you, think, you know, he, you're the left one. We don't need you anyway. He's right-handed. Now, that's being ludicrous, but this is what happens. If we see somebody in the church struggling or suffering or that maybe they're thinner than you, maybe they dress nicer than you, maybe they have a nicer car, maybe they have a, a better looking wife, you can't imagine the stuff that goes through people's minds and how it lands. And there's all kinds of that going on. If not, why would Paul even be talking about this? Now, we can never see ourselves from these scriptures here we can never see ourselves separate or alone from others. 
Being in the church makes you part of each other. And because you can see the eye and the hand, the jointly fitted together, it should be a closely knitted people that are not in competition, that are not dividing from one another. And um, so everything that God does for you as an individual, individually we have a relationship. Okay, I'm not getting rid of the individual, I'm just saying, as the individual has Christ in them and there's a relationship, everything that God does for you has to and will always benefit the other members that you're close with. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's never, God's not blessing you just for you. God's not giving you revelation just for you. You have a gift, you're called, you, God speaks to you. It is for you, but it's for other people. It's never to stop with us. And that's why giving is so big. God blesses us, and it's not just for us to go spend on ourselves, but we take some of that, and we bless those that, that might be in need. So it's, it's, it's all from a body ministry perspective. And, um, but for some reason... And we know the reason. It's, it's pride, it's ego, it's narcissism, it's all of the above. Um, individualism seems to be, we, we, we seem to be separate. We seem to live separately from one another. And you've heard me, myself, and I, us, us four, no more, all that. The culture in America seems to, to be individualized, more so than coming together as community, as whole, especially in the church. And I've always said, if you want to know what the church looks like, just look at what the world is doing. It seems like we always follow suit. If you see it happening out there, you're more than likely going to see it happening here, whereas this should be the difference. This should, you know, the church should always be the one leading the way, not the world leading the way. And the church is trying to keep up with the ways and means of, of the world rather than being authentic and original and not copy because we listen the church can never be and we are in competition with the world well why am I, I'm, I'm not why would I want to compete with the world I, I'm, it's a whole it's a whole different game in the kingdom right mm -hmm. we're in the world not to compete but we're in the world not of it to compete but we're in it to draw people to us and be the light and lead the way not copy them and compete with them. Now watch where we go with this. Now, you, this is what you see in the world today. And again, what you see out there, it's sad when you see it in the body. Is, and you got, if you got your outline, you'll see where I'm going with this. We always are trying to get ahead of somebody else. Always trying to get ahead of somebody else. Um, look how we drive. Go out there and drive. There's always somebody got to be faster than you. There's always got to be somebody who pulls out in front of you, and you look in the rearview mirror, and a soul behind you, and all they had to do is wait two seconds for you to pass, because there's nobody. I can see if there's a long line of traffic, and you want to do, you want to dart out there. I get that, but no, it's about you. It's about you, not me having to put my brakes on, but it's about you getting ahead of me, and there ain't a soul behind me. We see this maneuvering on the interstate. Everybody's. If you just sit back and just go about 65. And just watch. Everybody's posturing. Everybody's maneuvering. How about just get on there, do the speed limit, and just respect everybody? It doesn't happen. There's road rage more so now. There, it, it's just there's there. It's it's a um, selfishness in driving. You can be sitting there, ain't nobody gonna let you out. You'll have 30 cars pass you by, and ain't a soul gonna let you out. And I had a message, if you remember, on grace driving. What is grace driving? They don't deserve, rather than me, just put, get up there. I know he's trying to get in. I, I, I paid my dues to wait in this line. You ain't getting in. How about just unmerited favor? How about letting them in there and, and drive gracefully? Be grace-oriented. Be other person-minded when you're driving rather than yourself. But when you see Christians doing this, and probably worse at, at times, where, where is this coming from? And that's all, that's, well, I'm sorry. Where is it coming from? It's in the church. And we're not teaching what I'm going to about. I'm telling you, I've never heard anybody, not that they haven't taught on it, but if you know me, I am, I'm always got my ears listening. I'm, I've got, I'm reading. I'm, I'm, I've got my fillers out there. And I've not heard anybody talking about what we're going to talk about tonight. It's like 
Nobody wants to talk about it. Um, being first in line, outdoing others, competition. The church seems to follow this pattern as the world. And the kingdom of God, knowing the scriptures and hearing Jesus, the kingdom of God does not promote any of those things I just mentioned above. But Paul says, we don't live for ourselves, we live for others. Now go to this, this is the one that I'm going to tell you a little story here in Philippians. That's when, let's read it. Let me just tell you the story. So I'm 20 years old. I'm still in youth group. And, um, and we had a family move in. And they had brothers and sisters. It was a big family. And um, they were about our age. And we noticed that everything that you said you did, either they could outdo you or they know somebody that outdid what you just did. So, it, and it got to where we all saw it. That if you said you, you, you killed a, a, a five, point de five point buck, well, I bought, I, I, they're going to tell you that they killed one bigger or they knew somebody that killed one bigger than that. No matter what you, what you talk about, they're going to always upstage it with themselves or at least some, somebody that they know to minimize what you're saying and what you have or what you're doing. Have you ever been people like that that just can't rejoice over the fact that you've got something going on? No, I know somebody who's done it better than that. So there's no rejoicing there. What is that? It's competition. Jealousy. Now, now so this got really bad. Now, we're a youth group of probably, at this time, 50 plus. And, um, and it got really bad to where other people were going, these people... What's, what's going on? Every, and it's like it was noticeable. So I'm, I guess I'm 20 years old, and I'm, and I'm reading through the, every year I'm trying to read through the Bible. So I'm reading through the Bible, and I'm getting to Philippians, and I get to this verse. And, um, it's, and listen to what this verse says. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Let nothing be done. Don't do you. Don't do, don't let anything be done so make, because it's you, your ambition, selfish ambition, or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Now here we go. You ready for this? You don't see this, but this is this is this is the nature of God. This is this is Christ. But in lowliness of mind, humility of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And I said to myself. Well, that, they don't do that. And God says, I'm not talking about them. What am I, what am I saying here? So I thought, I'm going I'm to test this out. So when we're around these, these, these braggarts or whatever you want to call them, I'm going, to, I'm going to esteem them. And so like if I'll say something and they want to do it one I'll just say, really? You did that? Oh, man, that is so cool. And esteem them, what? Better than myself. Because this was this this attitude that these kids had was harming the unity we had before they got there. <laughs> you ever have somebody, these these new people show up and it's like everything was going fine till you showed up, and now we got to deal with you. So I flipped it, turned the tables. I did exactly what they said, and I'm telling you, it changed everything. My, at least my relationship with them, because I thought, no, you know what he says. He says, I'm supposed to make them feel, esteem them better than myself. So when I walk away from them, they should feel like they're better than me. Rather than get my pride and ego hurt over how they're, I'll, I'll just lift them up. Ain't about me. It's about, is, is that what you're seeing being said right there? Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Is that the last one for that? Mm -hmm. Okay, keep that up there. Now, do you see what's happening here? Now, let's look up the word esteem. I, ha I looked it up. It's on your outline there. And this is what it says for, for the word esteem. The regard in which one is held. High regard. The worth, value, opinion, and judgment of that person. To set a high value on them regard them highly and prize them accordingly so you know what the, for us to be able for I, I'm, I'm like I can talk to Paul Paul I'm, 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 I'm in this church and I get this letter 
I'm going to say, Paul, the only way I can do that is if I don't have any pride. It's going to take a major hit to my pride and ego. And if I'm a narcissist, this ain't going to happen. Because they bow to me. Because, you know, narcissism's horrible. And I think we all have a little piece of it, but some, man, they think the whole world orbits around them. And everything is about them. And everybody got to gravitate to them and what they're doing. And they can't stand anybody getting any tension that doesn't come, doesn't get to them, or should be to them. Now, um, so the question is, do you find this attitude? Now, if you go to Philippians, we don't have time to read it, but he, he says, let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. And so this is the mind of God, is that we esteem others better than ourselves. And that's hard to do when your ego says, I'm better than that. I'm better than that person. I didn't do what they did. I never sinned like they did. Or um, I'm from a wealthy family, and they're from a less wealthy family. I'm of this ethnicity, and they're from another. Have we not been through this? Have we not gone through this with whether it's it's um, racism, whether it is um, class warfare? All this stuff is judgments again. And, and the Bible says when you come to the church, this stuff doesn't shouldn't even exist nowhere. But that we can can we esteem one another better than ourselves? Now this is not a legalistic message because I'm going to tell you something. This is the nature of the Lamb. This is Christ in you, esteeming that person better than you. Because that's how Christ wants us to live, and that's how we live for others, and not for ourselves. And we make it about other people, and not ourselves. But this is not the spirit and attitude in the church today. Okay? Now let's, let's move on here. Um, leaders in the church, because if the leaders aren't modeling this, then that, that filters down to the church. So watch the leaders. Watch the ministers. And every, I'm, I'm telling you, there's so many churches that are in competition with each other. If, so, if something happens bad in the church and there's a split, I'm telling you, the other church is rejoicing because they're going to gain at least 50 of those. Rather than say, hey, no, um, can, what can we do? You know, you're suffering and we're going to suffer with you. Or if they're over there having a big revival and God's blessing them, the other church is going, what, what, what's going on over there? Rather than go over there and get in on it, they're like that and they'll, 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 they'll criticize it. There's so much competition in churches today. I've been in, I know it. I'm, I know you may not know that, but if you're in that leadership role and you hear the things being said and done, you know that it's existing. And the fact that you can't get them to do anything together because they're afraid that if they do something together, they might lose a few over to you. So they don't, they, you know, one guy's having a revival, they don't come. This guy's having a revival, they don't come. We're, 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 there's no unity because there's competition. It has, why, why else would there not be unity? If there's no, if, and it comes down to you got a church of 20 people who's going to have, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to get myself in trouble here. But I'm just telling you my thoughts. You got a church of about 30 people, and they're going to do a vacation Bible school in the summertime. And you only got 30 people, so you probably got 10 adults that are going to do um, Bible, vacation Bible school for five kids. And they don't got the money, they don't got the volunteers, and it's just going to be cheesy. Let's be honest. And just two miles away, a church of a thousand is going to do it right and it's going to be great and why not just take those five kids and really let them enjoy themselves up there and then show hey you're supporting what they're doing because I can't compete with what you're doing in that so I'm gonna make my kids go through some cheesy thing that they're going to be bored out of their their, their minds or I can just hey guys let's, let's just support with this they, they got it going over there let's wreck you know let's let's bless our kids and send them over there you're not gonna see that happen 
You may in some circles, but for the most part, well, well I'm afraid because what's going to happen is when the parents take the kids over there, the parents might like what else is going on over there, and I might lose them. So, is that competition? Eh? I've, lost, I've lost people to churches. Do you know if God would, would, would answer most pastors' prayers is, Lord, give me some of those, you know, fill my church up with those people. Send, send 10 over here, 20. I don't, you've heard me say this. I don't want what the people that are in other churches. And do you know why? If God would sovereignly put them in my church, they would be miserable. Because I don't have what the church has that they came from. Why would I want them here? I can't give them what the other church is giving them. And that's why they're there. They're over there because the church has something they want and feel like they need. But if I'm going to say, God, bring them back, bring me. Bring, bring, why? They'll just sit there and be miserable because you're, number one, they're there because they like the pastor. You bring them here, they don't like me. Why would I want them here? But you know there are guys who want to date a girl even though she don't like him. He still wants to, wants to have her. I don't care if you don't like me or not. You'll learn to love me. Why would you want people in your church that other that they're going somewhere else? See, if, if there's no competition, it doesn't even register that you may lose or you may gain. It's not about that, is it? Does the owner at McDonald's, I say the guy who owns McDonald's, he got he's got Bridgeport or East East Point, he's got uh, Nutter Ford, he's got Clarksburg, and um, does he care which one you go to? So they asked McDonald's years ago, you might remember this, why aren't you in the, in the business of putting down the other fast foods? Like Wendy's says, where's the meat, where's the beef? And that was, that was directed to McDonald's little, little cheeseburgers. And then Burger King says, have it your way, which is no one else is doing this. So, so they're trying to capitalize on each other by putting each other down or showing the weaknesses of the other. And they go to McDonald's and says, why don't you ever get into this, this kind of advertisement? And they said, we're too busy making burgers. That was the response. We're, 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 I mean, they're, the, they're leading. We don't have, we're just too busy making burgers to worry about what the other people are doing. Or to even throw stones at the other people. Or do bad advertisements against them. We're just too busy making burgers. How come we can't be so busy doing the God's purposes and plans that it doesn't even dawn on us to be, to be jealous or com competitive with, with the people around us or among us. That make sense? Yeah. All right, 2 Corinthians 10. We, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So, and again, I'm, I'm picking on the leaders because if the leaders can't model it, you can't expect the, the, the people under them to, to model it either. You know, it's got to, you've got to speak this into the people. So, you know, what, the, the competition is that we're comparing our churches to other churches. Well, we, we, they have a smoke machine. We got to get one. They, they, he's dressing like that. I have, a, I have a friend, and he's, he's a no BS guy. And he started going to this church. It's kind of big. And he, he began to, he, and he's, he was raised in church, so he's very critical. He sees things other people don't see. And he was telling me this, and I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. But the, this particular pastor wears a particular outfit and, um, and particular shoes and just, this style and he said that's cool if that's if that's what he wants to wear he said but then he began to realize all the people on staff that were males all of a sudden a lot of the guys are dressing the same way as the pastor he says that can't be that he's like they got they got they got the and i'm not, I'm not going to say why i don't want i'm just not throwing anybody under the bus here i'm just saying they've got this type of shoe they got this type of outfit he says and and everybody is modeling themselves after the pastor so this is one of the things the Lord showed me was when we get into competition, we lose our authenticity. 
Because what ends up happening is if I'm competing with somebody, I'm, what am I doing? I'm comparing myself to that person. And so I've either got to dress like them or dress even better. Or I've got to come out and dress. And you see the, the, the dressing that's happening like that. Why, just, why not just be authentic and if you want to wear, wear that? And don't copy somebody. Just be you. Just be you. Because the, this, this copy, competition, be like somebody or be better than somebody else. He says here, it's not wise to compare yourself um, among, uh, um, how does it say here? Uh, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves is not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us. In other words, here's another thing. Um, you can watch and see, hey, th these people are writing books. I don't write books. Well, that's the sphere that God has them in. Now, why, why not rejoice over the, the good things that are happening to them rather than get jealous or be competitive? Well, i gotta, I got to do what? I gotta. When you do this, you are no longer authentic because Paul says we're staying within the measure of where God has placed us gift-wise. I'm not comparing myself with anybody. I'm being faithful to do the gift God's given me. I won't let myself get jealous. I won't compete with anybody else. You'll see why this makes a lot of sense when I get to the end. I'm, I'm saving the best for the end, but I'm just trying to lay some groundwork here. Competition keeps us from being authentic. To compete means I have to compare myself to others. I'm not, and if I do that, I'm hearing them, not God. I'm watching them, not what the Spirit's doing. My whole thing is, uh, let me give you an example. I, I, I was working in a ministry years ago, and the leader of that ministry would every now and then go and be with other leaders that have the same type of ministry that I was in. And I saw a trend happening. Every time he left, he would come back to implement things he saw what the others were doing. And it would only last for a week or two before it's just not who we are. And it would just fizzle out. And then six months, a year later, he go, and, and I saw the trend, and, and so I hear, so-and-so's leaving to go, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm thinking to myself, he's going to come back, and he's going to try to implement something, and it's just not going to, it's never worked yet. Just, this is working. This is working. Now, I'm not against if God says do something different. I'm not against that. But if you're just going, this is what I'm saying, you're not hearing God you're comparing your ministry to someone else's ministry. They heard God to do that, and now you're copying because you're comparing to compete to get the results they're having, and you're not authentic, are you? You see what I'm saying about the, not being authentic when you're when you're comparing? Because you're why are you comparing? So you could copy. Well, why are you copying? So you can be better than them or be like them. Because you want what they have. Does that make sense? So here's another thing. If I'm competing, I'm not resting in who I am. Or the sphere that God has placed me in, where I'm at, my eye is always on what other people are doing. Always on. What did, what did Israel do? We want a king. Why would they want a king? God, God never said, hey, got to have a king. Before we, before we leave Egypt, we're going to get you a king. We're going to get you your own Pharaoh. He didn't do that for how long? Why did they want a king? Because the other, because the other nations had a king. So what were they doing? Rather than being their authentic self and what God was leading them into and how he was doing it, they were looking at the other nations and says, huh, we want to. So they implemented a king, and who was it? And what did God say? You don't want a king. He's going to put your, your children to war and he's going to tax the daylights out of you. And what did the kings do? They sent the kids to war and taxed them every, uh, every king. And if the king was bad, the whole nation got judged for it. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, did, did, is it real, do you really want a king? Anyway, that's just something to think about. I'm not resting in who I am if I'm looking at somebody else. We start copying others and what others are doing, and then in order to do it better, that means we're going to capitalize on their weakness so we can do it better in order to draw their people over to us. I remember being in a 
setting and I was talking to two, uh, an elder and one of the pastors of a church. I, didn't, I wasn't going there. I was just talking to him. And somebody in that church had left to start another church. And they were calling the people to come <coughs> over to the new church that this guy was starting that he, you know, whatever, left and started the church. And they went to him because they were friends and said, don't, 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 no, don't be calling our people. But this guy was building his church on another church's people's. And saying, why don't you come over here? We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Capitalizing on the weakness. And this, and this guy built a big church. But the beginnings of it wasn't authentic. It was capitalizing on a weakness. Because that other church was struggling at that time in certain areas. So my question is, are we not supposed to be on the same team? If we're on the same team, should that not change the way we treat each other as churches and as brothers and sisters in the Lord? If we're on the same team, then there's no competition. Now, it's sad when you got people competing that's on the same team. And then you got division. Let's take, um, let's take the uh, Chicago Bulls in the 90s. It seemed that they rallied around Jordan, but Jordan always brought everybody else's game up. I believe that, okay? I watched it habitually in the 90s, and I saw that everybody's game went, got better because he got better. They went, so, and they were in un unity, and they won games left and right. I mean, it was, it was just an awesome team. And um, now, however, if there was competition within that Within that, well, Phil Jackson probably wouldn't even allow that. But nevertheless, if there was, I ain't throwing it to him. Mike, Michael Jordan says, there's three seconds, throw me the ball. No, I'm going to do it. If that kind of stuff was going on, you're not going to win. And yet, Jesus said for us to be unified as one, one body. And who's the head of that one body? Yeah. Jesus. So then everything flows from Jesus down into that body, and he says, you are to be one as me and my Father are one because you're a body jointly fitted together where there is no competition because the eye recognizes it's not a hand, but the eye will need the hand to reach for what the eye sees. And never be in competition with each other and respect what the others are doing. Now, I, I've not always been there but let me tell you something the older I get I keep raising a flag a white flag on some area of my life okay Lord you got that one you win that one I surrender to that I surrender to this and so forth and so on um, because I'm I, I don't want I, I want I got, I'm getting the revelation I had it back when I was 20 years old but I think somehow I was testing it more than I was you know really all up in it but I, I remember that and um, and the Lord has, has brought that back to my attention this week. That um, if you've got trouble with somebody in the body, I'm going to tell you, more than likely there's a jealousy problem. There's a competitive spirit going on. But I'm going to tell you how to fix it. Esteem them better than you. And you know what happens? They're gonna, if they're, they're hearing, they're going to esteem you better than can you imagine two people esteeming each other better than each other? The unity and the love and respect that you're going to have between two people that are trying to outdo each other and making each other better than them? Huh? I mean, you're talking about a well-oiled machine, man, that the enemy cannot couldn't sustain against. But the enemy loves division. And so he creates the jealousy, the competition, the comparing, and so forth and so on. And we're not the body that we need to be. Competition is healthy in America. You can get away with working 80, you know, if not a 40-hour week, you get applauded when you work a 60-hour week. And you're looked down that if you don't do the extra hours they offered you. Because we applaud hard work competition, so forth, just we, and we have Americanized the church. So you can get away. So a pastor, here, here's what's going on. The pastor gets into this mode, this rut, because it's been modeled to him and he doesn't know any better. That's why it's got to change. It's got to change from the top down. Um, is, is that I can hide my competition. 
my competitive spirit by saying we're doing it for the glory of God. And so they're applauding me for what I'm doing, but they don't know I've disguised my competition with passion and zeal for something. Or the bigger the crowd, the more money. And I want money, and I need a big crowd, and I'll disguise my greed and say, souls! We're going after souls. we got to get more souls. We want to win the world to Jesus. But in essence, it's really about you want more people because big is better. It's a competition. I can get more people. I bid, bid, bid. My goal is to be the biggest church in Clarksburg. Why? Where, where is that even on the radar of what God wants? He didn't say go out and get, make, and get, and get the biggest churches and, make, and get the biggest church. But what's the goal of big numbers? Why? Because it, it's a bigger church, more money, and more prestige, and, is, and, and, the, and the motive. The motive is all about... But we, we, so what I'm saying is, you can disguise this stuff and just spiritualize it. We're doing it for Jesus. And, I, I, and, and you, as a church, will applaud me. So because I've got a disguise on, you're applauding my zeal for this, but in reality, you're applauding my competitive spirit that I want to be bigger and better than every other church in town. And you know what? Nobody likes a loser, so we like it when we're the biggest church in town. We like it when we win and somebody else loses. We like it, I got the, I got the position and so-and-so didn't. What are we going to do... Because we had this problem, as little church as we are, we had, and Diane will remember this, we had two worship teams. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, I'm, I can't let somebody sit there on their gift. If you, if you can do worship, then, you know, we'll rotate. And, or if somebody's a good teacher, maybe even a better teacher than me, probably they'll teach more here if I feel they've got the, the, the word and, they're, and God tells me to do it, of course. But I'm not going to, he's a better teacher than me. I'm going to sit him down. Okay, I can't, you can't, that's competition. If somebody comes and they have a gift, you can't be jealous over that gift. Your job is to esteem them better than yourself and let them use that gift. Even at the risk and cost of maybe you not getting to use your gift as much. Let me give you, let me give you a true story. And this is the grace of God. So, in 95, I was associate pastor of a large church, and the senior pastor was leaving. And so, I put my, hat, my um, hat in the ring, and another, so, uh, the, another pastor came to me and says, well, would you mind if I also? Um, now, I'm associate, and you think, well, I... I'm next, next in line if you want to play that pecking order thing. But again, it doesn't work like that. But I could have got jealous and competitive. and I said, no, man, absolutely, go for it. So if that wasn't bad enough, and I didn't really get bothered by that. I go to, to um, I was on a board of an evangelistic association in Fairmont, and that guy who's an evangelist says, I, I hear that your pastor's leaving. And um, I said, yeah. He goes, would you mind if I put my hat in the ring? Now, this guy is well-equipped. I mean, he's got degrees. And I, and I used to go to his church, and he, he's good. I liked him. I was under him. And, he, and I said, no, man, go for it. Go for it. God would not let me have a competitive spirit or I would go in and try to say and do things to, to make the leadership not like this guy or this, that, or the other. I'm like, hey, I want what God wants. Because I had that I had that understanding. And plus, God had spoken something to me. And I said, I want what God wants. If I'm not supposed to be there, I won't be there. This is not about competition. This is about who does God want here. And still love both of those guys if you didn't get the position. And I think a lot of times we, we don't think like that, do we? It's like, well, what do you, you know that I'm, I put my hat in the ring. What do you, you try to take this position from me? And you, you're, you're an evangelist. And you're trying. I could have just, I said, no, I honest to God, because I knew 
God would put the guy in there he wanted. And if, he, if, and, and if the people made the wrong decision, so be it. I was also willing to say, if you do get it, I'm staying because I'll be under you again. And if the other guy got it, who was mostly a peer of mine, I'm, I wasn't planning on going anywhere. And if they got it, I would have stayed because I, I enjoyed being there. It was, it, it was a great church, you know, in my opinion. But... Um, all I'm saying is, where does the competi- where would competition come in at there? It doesn't, does it? Where does competition come in in the body? If somebody sings better than you, somebody preaches better than you, somebody um, makes more friends than you, you've been there 20 years, you only have a few friends. This guy just got here and everybody's flocking to him. I mean, you know, jealous. This is the stuff you have to watch out for because it's, it happens. This, these, these thoughts come through your mind. But you're not your thoughts, by the way. So if there's a jealousy in your, in your, as, as a thought pattern, that's not who you are. Just because you thought it. We, we don't have this. I, I, we're we're going to teach on this someday. You are not your thoughts. And you know what we do with our thoughts? Everyone, grab that one. That's right. And then we just, you're not your thoughts. You're only what comes out of your spirit. And you have the mind of Christ. You're not your thoughts. You're, whatever your brain does, that's not the mind of Christ. So you don't, you don't have to own the thoughts that come. What you do is you filter them by the Spirit through the Word and grace, and you realize, that ain't right. There's no, now, let me move on here, because I'm, I'm running out of time. I want to I get to this. I want to get to the end here, because the end's good. Um, Romans 12, 15 through 18. Is that the last one? Mm-hmm. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Share, and this is the amplified classic version. Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joy. And weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish, high minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people, things, and get yourselves. To humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. Now look at it. Repay no one. Repay no one evil for evil. Look what they did to me. I'm getting them back. You got that. Vengeance. But take thought for what is honest and proper and noble. Aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Okay, so this this is body ministry. All these scriptures we looked at is how we treat each other. But here's where I want to go. And it's not on your outline because, again, you'd you'd sit there and think, there's that scripture again, but let's let's write it down. Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ, what? Who lives in me. All right, now watch this. Do you know why I esteem you better than me? I recognize it's no longer you, but Christ in you. And if I get jealous of you, I'm getting jealous of Jesus. Well, wait, wait, what? Now watch. He says, remember the sheep and the goats? He says, you fed me when I was hungry. He says, Lord, when did we feed you? When you did it to other people. Because when you fed other people, what were you doing? Feeding him. Lord, you visited me when I was in the hospital. Lord, when was you in the hospital? You were never sick. Well, when you visited other people in the hospital, you visited me. And you know what? You visited me when I was in prison. Lord, you were never in prison. Yeah, I was. When you visited them, you visited me. Is that what he says? Mm-hmm. So when we're saying how to be in competition with you is to be in competition with the Christ in them. I'm esteeming. I'm, I can esteem you because I see you valuable and worth something because of the treasure that's in you called Christ. And we don't see Christ in each other. We see the flesh 
And we see the sin, we see the failures, we see the weakness, and we want to compare ourselves to you. How, I, how am I going to compare myself to you when I see Christ in you and Christ is in me? What's the comparison? You got what I got, the treasure. But we do. On and on. This is the games the church plays. And then, when I, and then what really prompted me to teach this, give me five minutes, I'm done, is social media. I'm, I see so many people posturing. So many people putting down somebody else's belief system and, and say that, hey, they, they believe that. We don't. And I can't believe they believe that. Well, you may have believed it one time. And God still met you where you were at in your crazy theology and brought you to where you are today. You probably got crazy theology today. He's going to bring you out of that too. But when I see people posturing and putting down churches and denominations and, um, and movements and things at the risk of them making themselves look better because they got the right message and you may not have the right message. So that just makes me look better than you. What, 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 that, that's posturing. And that is doing a one-upmanship, is it not? Hmm? So my point is that, um, or this one. So, um, I saw this on one the other day. This, this, um, this guy had a big church in Chicago and years ago, something happened. It wasn't sexual sin or anything like that, but it was something that happened, and he was asked to leave. And they, they, they loved you. The, the, the journalists loved using the word disgraced. So before you say his name, you'll say disgraced pastor so and so. How does he ever bounce back to recovery and restoration when you keep calling him disgraced? I promise you that if Jimmy Swagger did something today that caught the attention of the media, they will put on there, disgraced, Jimmy Swagger did this. When does he get to come back? When does he get to bounce back? Now, when Christian journalists are doing it, what, 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 what is that all about? I was watching a James Robson program in 2012, 2011, and, um, and he was talking on a subject, and, it, and he, he paraded on the intro, um, all the you know drug addicts on the street, prostitutes on the street, and there's Jimmy Swagger doing that infamous "I've sinned, forgive me" Psalm 51 or whatever. Remember that? That played they played a million times. They put that up there. Now this is 2012, 2011. The thing that happened with Swagger was 1988. When do you, when are you going to let that go? So I emailed. James Robbins, is, you, you, that, that's horrible. When does that guy ever get to live that down? What are you doing? By, by playing that, you, what, you make yourself look good. You got, you're putting prostitutes, you're putting drug addicts, and you're putting swagger, you put Hitler, and you put... He was in the, he was in the lineup with all this evil. I'm like, what is that about? I got, it, I got a response back. Oh, we're not in charge of the intro. Somebody else, that's, we, we, we do that. That's out. That's out. They, they source that out. I'm like, you didn't look at it? And say, edit that out. And I'm just like, what is, the, what, what, what is that about? I don't know. I don't want to judge the motive, but that wasn't right. And it looked like to me, rather than cover that guy, you were exposing him all over again. And what would be the motive for that? So I see this stuff in media, I see it on social media, I see this, this competition. I gotta have more likes than this guy, so I gotta put something, and they tell you, if you wanna keep, put, put something up every day. Man, you're wearing me out when you put something up every day. If everybody puts something up every day, I'm not gonna read everything, because I can't. Just put something up there when you get a word. You don't have to put something up there every day. Do you? I mean, what, what, what are we, what are we, it's, 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 it's self-promotion, it's posturing, it's see me, hear me, feel me, you know, Tommy the Who song. It's like, no, I'm, 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 I'm getting too much of you. I can't read everything you do anyway. And I, and I just see so much of this. And it's like, Lord, what is the root of all this? And I've got to believe what drives these people are the likes. How many likes can I get out of this? How many likes can I get out of that? Because they, how, how many viewed me on YouTube? It's, if that's the motive, we're in bad shape. And not everybody has that motive. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. 
But when you see the content and the exp and, and the way they're doing it, where they're they're just they're a lot of this is posturing. I'm sorry, it just is, and, and it's like this is somebody's got to say something, and no one's saying anything. It's like we don't see this happening. Are we blind to what we're seeing? I see it, and I'm like, Lord, deliver us, because do you know how horrible it is to be competitive? Because it's driving you. You're watching that person. You're looking. How many likes did he get? How many get on his face? How many views did he get? What does it matter? Unless you're comparing yourself to his ministry. How about honor? What If he has more likes than you, rejoice with him over that. Isn't that what he says to do? Rejoice with those who rejoice? You see a guy, he get, a friend of yours gets a new building and you still got the dilapidated building you're in. How, you can't, can't rejoice with them? But mostly, I can't do anything about that. But in our assembly, let us be of that mind where we esteem each other better than ourselves and not let any jealousy, com competitive spirit, or any division of that nature come. And we, we will be tested because as people come, they're going to get in your way and they may have the same gift you have and they may even be better in the gift they may have than you. We have to esteem them better than us. Even if they're not better than us. I, it's like, well, what, what if they're not better than me? Well, you're already wrong because you should see them better than you anyway. Think about that one. Hmm? Well, that's going to be really hard. Well, it's because you don't see other people better. But that's, but again, that's not something I'm trying to put on you. I'm saying this is, the, this is what grace does. Grace teaches us to be godly. Grace teaches us to manifest the nature of God to one another. And we are big on oneness. We're big on grace. And we've got to be big on this. Amen? Questions or comments? I know it's a, not one of those popular, but... Um, it's good. It was good. <coughs> Father, we bless you and thank you so much for giving us eyes to see. We're not perfect, but we, we, we see something, Lord, and we, we want to be Christ-like. We want to manifest the nature of the Lamb. And then Paul gives us clear scriptures on how to do body ministry, how to minister to one another, how to see one another, and let nothing bring division in any way, shape, or form, not even a competitive spirit, not even jealousy but that we esteem each other better than ourselves.